little breakdown in communication, as Joel said. <laughs> Cousin John, do you have any stories for us? Yeah. Anybody? Okay. Well, looking back, the time span between 1945 and maybe to 1960 might have been called the restless years. Due to the fact, I think, that uh, millions of servicemen were returning and re entering the nation's social structure. And that kind of an influx can disturb the balance a little bit here and there, such as the labor market. So a lot of moving and shifting took place in those years. A lot of cowboys, pre-war cowboys, didn't ever get back in the saddle. They chose something else. And a good portion of those that did had a bit of trouble staying put for a while. It just takes some time for the nesting instinct to overcome the compelling urge to explore the possibility to cross the river and over the mountain. <laughs> some of us appeased that urge by day working around the country. So some years ago, well over 50 to be exact, <laughs> a puncher named Chalmer Davis and I drifted into Oregon looking for work. Our excuse, I suppose, was knew that I was never been there. But it didn't take long to find a job. But the range boss told us, said, if y'all not really hurting for a meal yet, I'd rather have you back here in a week or ten days. So Chow and I decided to do a little sightseeing. On our way to Crater Lake, which is worth seeing, by the way, we stopped in time with Falls. And it's kind of a policy of ours when we were in foreign country to try to get acquainted with some natives and learn something about the local customs. <laughs> so with that in mind, we wheeled in the first handy bar. <laughs> well, business wasn't booming. There was one fellow sitting at the bar, and there was a lady sitting by herself way back, back at the table. Child headed straight for the bar, and I headed straight for the table. <laughs> this is all an interest in research, you understand. I just, I just had to find out how a woman could look so lonesome, thirsty, and predatory all at the same time. <laughs> Fifteen years later, I would have followed Child to the bar. So the first time I ever saw Steph, she was wearing that same cat chasing the canary expression. <laughs> <laughs> But I was still kind of green then, so I held my course. And I got a little closer, I could see she was Indian. <laughs> now, storybook Indian maidens are always young, beautiful, innocent, little wee, graceful creatures with eyes like limpid pools, whatever that means. <laughs> and the lady in front of me didn't quite fit that. <laughs> Her 30 odd years had taken a toll. <laughs> Even so, she, the features were not unpleasant and her eyes were clear enough. But, uh, a little bit graceful just didn't fit at all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, she was built pretty much like Dick Winters. Everybody knows Dick, I think. <laughs> <laughs> just not as big. But she was definitely a woman, so. I asked if I'd buy her a beer. A nice, sudsy relationship was born right then. <laughs> now, I never did find out about Lonesome, but she was plenty thirsty. <laughs> After a while, I had to go to the restroom. Chow came striding in, looking like an overprotective parent, and got right to the point. He said, that fellow up the bar lives here and he seems to know everybody. 
And he says that gal you're talking to is the meanest individual in southern Oregon, if not the whole damn world. I said, oh, child, you know how stories like that get started. I said, she seemed like a right nice lady. Just relax and enjoy your beer. Because we sure ain't talking about fighting. <laughs> Well, by and by, we decided to broaden our base a bit, so we drove across town and went to another bar. It wasn't much bigger than the first one. And the gal serving drinks looked us over and asked if we were working around there anywhere. And we said no, but we had hired out to the ZX's over around Paisley. She turned around and looked us over again. She said, ZX's, huh? Cowboy, where's the buggeroo? I said, duh, what's the difference? She said, well, dummy, cowboys are camp men and buggeroo stay as a wagon. Oh, I guess that makes us buggeroo. I never have quite forgiven that gal. She knew that much, she could have warned us that we were smack dab in the middle of a snaffle bit in daddy country. <laughs> As it was, we didn't find out about that till we got to the wagon. The child and I not only didn't own a snapple bib, we just barely knew what one was. But the wagon boss was unperturbed. He loaned me an extra he had in the wagon and he cut the child down on horses that more or less tolerated unfamiliar pack from foreign cowboys and so <laughs> Neither one of them knew how to doubt either. But I never thought that is too much of a handicap. However, it didn't take those big trashy horses on that outfit for a couple of days to promote some pretty serious thoughts about learning. <laughs> so, <laughs> but everything worked out pretty good. They were just shaping up for the winter and Brandon. I had a couple of horses in my mouth that I could tie hard on without being harassed by vivid visions of open graves and weeping predators. And so we kind of settled in for the work. Not only me until the wagon pulled in, it stayed out year round. We sure weren't going to stay there through the winter. But they had a lot of cash around and we thought we would. They estimated about 7,000 we thought we would hang around until that was done. We hadn't got rid about halfway through before we froze out. Almost every day, the snow cap seemed to inch a little bit further down, and there was ice every morning in the wagon. And another item on the list of things we didn't have was the teepee. And our little old Texas bedrolls just weren't adequate. And this was in August, mind you. So we gave notice, and the day rolled around, headed south. It seemed like we never did go in a very straight line. But when we finally did get to Southern Arizona, those Southern Arizona nights were sure welcome chains. <laughs> oh, that was a lot of fun. You know, you're young, strong, don't have to have much rest, and you heal fast. <laughs> and it's several years before I found out there was a downside to that. We were out here to see wagon, several of us sitting around there about an hour or so before sundown one day. Ben, ben Kelvin came walking by and said, John, why don't you and Bill come with me? Well, I was instructed in an early age not to be asking questions, but Bill wouldn't turn like that. We hadn't gone very far, and he said, what the hell are three of us going to do at this time of day? Ben said, we're going to pull a windmill. Bill said, all right, let's use my new pickup. I just got through rigging it up, and I need to know if everything works. Ben was agreeable. He said, well, stop by my pickup and I'll grab a box of leather. We got over there and that mill was one of these little old narrow powers that you, two men are crowded working under there, little old three. We just started rigging up and Bill said, Ben, get out of the way. He said, John and I have done quite a lot of this. We don't need any help. He said, sit down out there somewhere and if, we do, if we're doing something that doesn't suit you, you can holler. Well, I hesitated a minute to see if we were going to be reminded who to run that operation. But Ben didn't say a word. He just turned over a five-gallon bucket outside the tower and sat down. Well, I think 
term now is that the job was a piece of cake. You work with six, seven joints, pipe and hole, which jerked those out of there pretty quick and went back and caught the bottom check. And for once, the damn thing didn't hang the top of the cylinder. So, so we, changed, we re lettered, checked the rivets. We had that rascal pumpkin for sundown. So we were loading up two blasts of the tools and Ben grunted or nodded or something to indicate his satisfaction. I never knew if Helton that indulged in conversation if a nod or a wave would do. <laughs> Elmer doesn't count, he gets paid to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but about that time, Bill said, what the hell are you doing using day hands to pull a windmill for anyway? He said, there were two steady hands to wagon when you got it us. And then I said, well, you were moving to camp tomorrow, and I wanted to be sure this thing was pumping before we left. Ben said, old Bill explodes for crying out loud. If that's the way it is, why don't you fire them some bitches and hire me an old job? Uh, ben was unrepentant. He said, I'll tell you, if I need one of them, I know where they are. And I'm not sure I could always find the beer joints you and John be hiding out in. <laughs> Which probably explains why I spent so much time in my youth loading and unloading my sack. <laughs> but if there, if there are any young guys here with a bad case of wanderlust, why, well, just follow the urge. It's a young man's game. Stack up too many miles, you can't do it anymore. And don't worry about the condition. He usually goes away about the second or third marriage. <laughs> anyway, that's about all I got to say. Thank you, Cousin Jim.